Hey, it's Dr. John Terry, the Black Belt Leader, and welcome to the Black Belt Leadership Podcast, where each week I'm giving you tips, tools, insights, and resources to help you become a better version of who you are and what you do as you discover, develop, and deploy your own Black Belt Leader within. Hey, this week, I want to pull some stories from the NFL, and I want to pose the question, who's waiting in the wings? Now, Joe Montana was one of the guys I enjoyed watching play football as I was growing up. Joe Montana played for the San Francisco 49ers. He was not one of my Cowboy fans, but he was still a fan I enjoyed watching. Now, Joe Montana, if you don't know his backstory, Joe turned down a basketball scholarship to North Carolina State to go join the University of Notre Dame under a football scholarship in 1974. Interestingly enough, he was one of seven quarterbacks recruited that year that were all competing for a spot. And jokingly, Joe, looking back, says, I played myself down to the seventh string position on the team. But Joe did get his start his sophomore year when he had the opportunity to help the Fighting Irish win two historic comeback victories, one against North Carolina, a second against Air Force. Joe again had the opportunity in 1977 to lead a comeback victory against Purdue. That same year, he went on to lead Notre Dame to a national championship in the Cotton Bowl against Texas. Now, <clears throat> Joe Montana left the Fighting Irish with an overall record of 25-4. and four. Now, that included that memorable national championship in 1977. But I think one of the keys of Joe's college career was in 1979 when he helped the Irish rally from a 34-12 halftime deficit. He led the team to score 23 points in the final seven minutes and 37 seconds of the game. That led Notre Dame to another Cotton Bowl win, even as he was battling flu-induced hypothermia. But with all of his success at the collegiate level, Joe Montana wasn't highly regarded as attractive or desirable by the pro scouts. In fact, he wasn't even drafted in the NFL draft until the 82nd pick overall. The third round 1979 draft, the San Francisco 49ers picked him up as their fourth quarterback pick of the year. But Joe Montana made the most of that 82nd pick overall, and he made his mark in the sport. He was known for his quick feet. He was known for his accuracy with the ball and his soft touch when he threw. But what really made him stand out was his remarkable sense of poise, especially under pressure. And this allowed him to thrive in San Francisco and to become one of the top athletes to ever play the game. And if you've ever had an opportunity to watch any of the NFL archives, you have seen the catch. January 1982, Montana connects with Dwight Clark in the back of the end zone against my Cowboys. And at that moment, that probably signature moment in Joe's career, that catch, the catch, Montana to Clark took the 49ers to the Super Bowl where they defeated Cincinnati to become world champions. Now, when it comes to Super Bowls, Montana was four for four and he was named Super Bowl MVP three times. He's one of only two players in NFL history to win four Super Bowls without any losses. And at the time Joe Montana retired, he was ranked fourth in career passing, 40,551 yards. He was ranked fourth in passing attempts with 5,391 yards, and he had 273 passing touchdowns. He was ranked third overall in completions with 3,409, and he was second as the all-time passer career rating of 92.3. Now, yes, me, that's not too shabby for a guy who was not attractive or not desirable to the pro scouts in 1979. But here's where the story gets better, and it leans into the lesson that I want to zero in on today. Waiting in the wings, training beside Joe Montana in San Francisco was a young man from Brigham Young University. This young man was Steve Young. Now, in 31 games at Brigham Young, Steve Young was responsible for 74 touchdowns, 592 passes he threw for 7,773 yards. He had 8,817 yards in total office. He was named a unanimous All-America Award winner, and he went on to win the Davy O'Brien and Sammy Baugh Awards and was recognized as the nation's top 
college quarterback. Now, Young was also recognized by the National Football Federation, the College Football Hall of Fame, and the NCAA as top scholar athlete. So not only was he good on the field, he was good in the classroom and was great with the books. In fact, Steve Young went on to earn his law degree in 1994. But I don't want to talk about his law degree. I want to talk about his career in the NFL. Steve Young went on to play 15 years in the NFL, and he led the 49ers to a Super Bowl championship in 1995, having been on the team when Montana led them to two of the three championships that Steve Young has under his belt. But in this 1995 Super Bowl championship, Steve Young threw six touchdown passes, and he earned the Super Bowl MVP. Now, Steve Young was also named the NFL's MVP in 1992 and 1994. So you may say, John, what's all this about the San Francisco 49ers and why is this important to today's Black Belt Leadership lesson? Well, I'm glad you asked the question because here's the answer. The role of a leader is to replace himself or herself in the lives of other people. The role of a leader is to prepare those who will one day take his or her place. So the 49ers leadership and Montana himself understood that preparation for the future is an integral part. It's not just getting to the top as a player and getting to the top as a team. It's about recruiting the talent that not just gets you there, but keeps you there. So having Young and Montana pushing each other on the practice field was a big deal. It made both of them better quarterbacks. Just like Sven Nader pushed Bill Walton at UCLA and made him one of the greatest career centers to ever play the game, Walton and Svader, uh, yeah, Walton and Sven Nader did that in the NBA. Montana and Young did that at San Francisco. Both of these men went on to enjoy illustrious careers in the NFL. As iron sharpened iron, they made each other better. And while Montana was leading from the front, here we see Young leading from the middle, waiting in the wings for his opportunity to step in and lead. Now, Drew Bledsoe was the quarterback of the New England Patriots at a time when the team was just beginning to rise in the dominance that they held for many, many years. Bledsoe played nine seasons for the Pats, and he was ranked second in team history with 2,544 completions and 29,657 passing yards. Bledsoe also ranked third in the team history with 166 touchdown passes. But Bledsoe got injured in 2001, and he was replaced by a young man who was drafted in the sixth round of the 2020 NFL draft. Now, interestingly enough, this young man was the 199th overall pick. He was skinny, he was sluggish, and he had one of the slowest sprint times at the NFL combine competition that year. Even in college, his senior year, his coach hesitated to start him because he was uncertain of his ability. Having started his junior year, he was relegated to a second string quarterback in his senior year, which damaged his prospects in the NFL. This young man, this awkward, sluggish, skinny, slow individual that had been recruited to play for the Patriots was Tom Brady. Now, this young man that everybody questioned, that everybody doubted, that no one really failed to see the value in, he went on to lead the Patriots to a dynasty. And Tom Brady retired by most accounts as the GOAT, the greatest of all times. He had more Super Bowl appearances, a total of 10, and more Super Bowl wins, a total of seven, than any other quarterback in NFL history. Tom Brady played in 15 pro Super Bowls, I'm sorry, played in 15 Pro Bowls and was a five-time Super Bowl MVP. So again, why this trip down NFL history lane, you may be asking. Well, there's an important lesson I touched on earlier. I want to make sure that you don't miss. And it starts with the question I opened this teaching with. Who's waiting in the wings? More importantly, let me break this down to where you are in your business or the team you're leading right now. Who is it that you are mentoring or coaching or training 
that's going to have the opportunity to step into your role in the future? Who are you preparing who will one day take your place? And here's another question I want to pose. Who is it that you might be overlooking who is waiting in the wings, looking for their one chance to rise to their full potential and lead the team into significance? Someone who sees the opportunity in them that nobody else sees. Let me give you another example. Brock Purdy was drafted by the, by the San Francisco 49ers in 2022. He was deemed Mr. Irrelevant. Now, that's a nickname that's given to the very last person to be drafted in the NFL draft. 49ers 2022, very last draft of the season. But I'm sure looking back, San Francisco was glad to have Mr. Irrelevant Mr. Purdy waiting in the rooms. Now, Purdy started out as a third string quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, but the first string quarterback and the second string quarterback both got injured. So Purdy got his opportunity to walk onto the field. And when he did, he not only showed up, he showed out. Purdy went on to lead the team to five regular season wins. And in the process, they secured a division title. They then went on to have an NFC championship appearance that year, but sadly didn't make it to the Super Bowl. Now, from there, Purdy went on to lead the 49ers to another division title in 2023, only to lose to the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl that year. Now, Danny White was the Dallas Cowboys quarterback when Troy Aikman was drafted. Now, Danny White himself was an exceptional player, and he led the Cowboys to five NFL championships and two Super Bowl wins before the torch was passed to Troy Aikman. Now, Troy Aikman waiting in the wings when he had the opportunity to step into the greatness of playing in the NFL, he went on to lead the Cowboys to six NFC East titles. They made four championship appearances and three Super Bowl wins. And oh, in the process, Troy Aikman set 45 Cowboy passing records in the process. Now, interestingly, if Steve DeBerg, an exceptional quarterback in his own right, was leading the 49ers when Joe Montana was drafted. Joe led in the middle until he got his chance. Montana was leading when Steve Young was drafted. Steve Young led from the middle until he got his chance. Drew Bledsoe was leading when Tom Brady was drafted. Tom led from the middle until he got his chance. Danny White was leading when Troy Aikman was drafted. Troy led from the middle until he got his chance to lead. So what's the takeaway from all of the NFL stories and all of the players that I pointed out in today's teaching? I believe there's six key takeaways that you and I can take from this story that we can apply to our lives and that we can apply to the teams and the organizations that you and I are leading right now. First is this, each organization that we look at, the Cowboys, the 49ers, the Patriots, every team that we've looked at and every successful team throughout history has a vision for the future. Those teams that I mentioned and others just like them look beyond their immediate needs and they recruit and groom new talent. Now, notice that they did that even when their current leaders were performing at the highest level. They didn't wait until their successful leader left before they went to find a successful replacement. They began to recruit and groom to prepare for the one day that their current leader would no longer be leading. Now, this is important because it ensures continuity and it helps prepare the organization for long-term sustainable success. Now, the second key takeaway to me is the fact that these teams, these organizations created an environment where this new talent that they had recruited and that they were grooming had an opportunity to learn and to grow. Now, it's important to remember that good leaders mentor and develop the leaders around them. They provide them with the tools, the guidance, and the resources that they need to learn and to grow. They correct they encourage, they inspire, they challenge, and they stretch them every single day. But these organizations, these teams also gave this new talent the opportunity to test and hone their craft first on the practice field and later on the playing field, building the confidence and the belief in themselves that it was time for them to show up and show out on the game field 
they had the opportunity to do so. Now, third to me, it's this. In business and in life, strong leaders focus on what's best long term. Strong leaders in a business focus on what is best for the organization, understanding they're not going to be there forever. So strong leaders don't just focus on getting the win today. They focus on empowering those around them to learn to lead themselves effectively, and they begin to groom the people that are going to one day take their place. Now, as good as you are and as good as I am, no matter how good we are, here's what I can tell you. Father time is undefeated. And we recently saw that in the Mike Tyson fight against Jake Paul. Good leaders leave the organization better than when they arrived because they develop the leaders around them. They add their own wisdom and knowledge to the collective wisdom of those leaders leaving the organization in a better place than when they found it. Now, the fourth key takeaway to me is resilience. Strong leaders have got to build strong, resilient teams, and they also have to build the systems and processes around those teams so that those teams can weather leadership changes without sacrificing performance. You've got to prepare future leaders to lead, and you've got to give them the opportunity to do so because this is an essential element of transitional success. So think about it. In the NFL, in the NBA, in all your major sports opportunities that are out there and on every major team, the second string and the third string quarterbacks in the NFL do get an opportunity to practice with the first string. That's an opportunity for the coaches to see if they are improving and growing to the point they're ready to step up to a higher level of leadership. And when you give those second and third string opportunities to step in and to practice with the first string team, you're building a culture of adaptability and resilience, and you are beginning to identify who's ready to step into the next level of leadership. Now, the fifth key takeaway to me is the fact that it is important for you as a leader to have a keen eye to look for those diamonds in the rough. Those people that may be overlooked or ignored by others. Tom Brady, a classic example. You've got to learn to recognize talent and sometimes trust your gut to see things that other people don't see. Because remember, as a leader, you see more and you see before. Tom Brady and Brock Purdy, both of those are classic examples of seeing something in someone that other people didn't see. The 199th draft pick and Mr. Irrelevant went on to lead their teams successfully when given the opportunity to do so. So remember this, good leaders have an eye for untapped talent and skill, and they have the uncanny ability to see raw potential in a recruit that that recruit may not yet see in themselves or that others may overlook or ignore. Now, the sixth quality I want to point out, this sixth key takeaway is this. Strong leaders develop a culture of excellence. I talk about this in my book, Black Belt Leadership 101, and the fact that black belt leaders in life live their lives with black belt excellence. You know, when you think about teams like the Patriots, the 49ers, and the Cowboys, they all emphasized high standards during their peak and their opportunity to win and reign at the top. They emphasize high standards, and as a result of that, they focused on creating a winning attitude and a strong belief in what was possible by the individual players and by the team as a whole. A strong culture of excellence helps current and future leaders thrive. Let me say that again. A strong culture of excellence helps current and future leaders thrive. Because when excellence is expected, that's what is given by the team. Because when you're willing to accept average, mediocre, or lackluster, and those things are acceptable to you, excellence takes a back seat in your organization. The very best teams and the very best organizations establish and maintain a culture of excellence that challenges every single team member to perform at their best, both individually and corporately, and they challenge every team member and the organization as a whole to continually improve. Now, that culture of excellence also extends to the individuals 
who are waiting in the wings. Those men and women who are hoping for their opportunity to get their number called and they have an opportunity to walk out onto the field and contribute to the win. So who's waiting in the wings? And more importantly, who should be waiting in the wings in your organization that isn't there yet? Who should you be recruiting to join your team that could be the next Brock Purdy, Tom Brady, or pick any of the other quarterbacks I talked about today? Who's that diamond in the rough in your organization or waiting to be picked up by you that if given the opportunity and given the chance could step up and shine and literally become the greatest of all time inside your team or inside your organization? So I want to challenge you to be looking for those that you should be recruiting in and identifying who needs to be in the wings. And once you've got them there and you've put them in the wings, you've got to answer this last question. What are you doing to prepare them to contribute at the highest level when you call their number and it's their turn to walk onto the field? I'm Dr. John Terry, the Black Belt Leader. I want to say thanks for joining me. Have a great day.